Well, that's it for this week. These stations are now closing down until 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, when we'll be broadcasting on medium wave, on short wave in the 90 metre band, on FM in the following areas, in Salisbury on 99,56 megahertz, Lomagandi, Mazoe and Bindura 92,25, Amtali 96,03, the Eastern District and Nyanga 96,63, Wenki 92,33, Victoria Falls 93,11 MHz, and Fort Victoria 98,96 MHz. From me, Pete Miller, good night, God bless, and golden dreams. <laughs> Very happy to be back with Group Captain Tol Yannicka. Um, Tol, this is by popular demand. You've been very well received, and um, people want to hear a lot more, so that's why we're here. But I know you want to start off with um, the correction. Uh, there was something that you got wrong about Rob Gaunt, and I know Hugh's been in touch with you, so let's get that ironed out. Yes, okay, uh, Hannes. Uh, you're right, shortly after the first episode was released, uh, Hugh contacted me from the States. I mean, we talk to each other still regularly. And he reminded me that uh, that incident with Rob Gaunt didn't in fact happen at Le Coq d'Or. It was at La Bon, La Bohème. <laughs> uh, and the second was that the story, which is related in his book, his very good book, uh, was initiated by himself. Uh, the main character, of course, remains Rob Gaunt, and the essence of the story remains the same. But I did say to Hugh that I would, uh, I would correct that, and if uh, anybody needs the full-blown version, get Hugh Slater's book. Yes. yes. Um, to, yeah, we were talking earlier about um, one of the principles of war being maintenance of morale, and um, that brings us to the question of Kazavaks and the importance of um, extracting wounded. Um, the Air Force was absolutely essential in that um, endeavor. And I know so many people say it was just incredible how determined the Air Force was at every event to get uh, wounded personnel out. So I just want you to talk a bit more about um, that whole process and maybe a few recollections of particular incidents. Uh, yes, it, you know, it was, uh, Hannes, and you, you're quite right, uh, maintenance morale is the second principle of war. And it was an advantage that we had in Rhodesia because of the Air Force capability. And it wasn't only the, the helicopters, although they carried the lion's share of those casualty evacuations. But other small aircraft uh, that we had in the fleet, like the Trojan and even the, the Cessna, and of course the Dakotas, if there were several wounded people, it received an absolute priority always from, uh, from us in the Air Force. If there was a request for a Kasavak, uh, it went right to the, to the very front of the list. And we, we, generally speaking, always had at least one uh, aircraft normally a helicopter, on call, on immediate standby uh, in, the, in the event of Kasavak, or if there were aircraft that were in the operational area that could be used immediately. And there are several examples uh, of uh, casualty evacuations that come to mind. In the early stages of the, the war, uh, in Op Hurricane, out of Centenary, I can remember we sent uh, a, a Trojan with Brian Murdoch and a medic down into the valley floor onto a strip where uh, there was a, a guy who had to be pulled out. He'd been wounded with a, a mortar. And uh, having landed there, it was a night evacuation. Um, Brian got the, the wounded guy on board, the Kasavak on board. And the end of the runway had been marked by a Land Rover with its lights on. It was just a flare strip with a Land Rover at the end. And unfortunately, the Trojan was always had fairly marginal power available to it. 
and Brian uh, on the takeoff run uh, got airborne and, and hit his uh, undercarriage onto the roof of the of the Land Rover, and that resulted in him crashing into the trees beyond <coughs> beyond the runway, and both. Uh, him and the medic and the casualty were unfortunately all killed in that accident. But it shows the priority that was given that even an aircraft like that would be used at night. Mm -hmm. Some of the, uh, some of the uh, other incidents of, of casualty evacuation that come to mind was one uh, in the Repulse area uh, when I was based in Fort Victoria. We had a request that came in from uh, from one of the army call signs near Utenga and Vic and the medic was and his uh, tech were called out. Vic Cook. Vic Cook, yeah, Vic Cook. And on the way there he flew over an, uh, an enemy camp which contained somewhere between 25 and 30 terrorists and he came under very heavy small arms fire. Uh, so much so that his tech was badly wounded Vic himself was wounded and the aircraft was disabled <clears throat> to the extent that the tail rotor shaft had been, had been shot out. He immediately descended to very low level uh, to try and clear or get clear of the ground fire but in fact he was, he was right on top of where the terrorists were and uh, he was forced to crash land the aircraft and he saw some terrorists in front of him and managed to maneuver the aircraft. Basically, he, you know, he's a, he was a very aggressive uh, and, and strong guy, Vic. He aimed the aircraft at these turrets on the ground and crash landed. We subsequently think that he hit one of the terrorists with the rotor blade because the terrorist was on the ground and Vic, knowing that his, his tech had been wounded, jumped out of the aircraft and wrestled the AK-47 away from this chap on the ground, the terrorist, shot him with it, and then for the next 10 or 15 minutes kept the terrorist at bay with this AK-47. Vic's Uzi had been disabled as well, had been taken around through it in the cockpit, so he couldn't use that. But it shows you the, the kind of determination and courage that uh, the guy had. Uh, he only realised after some time on the ground that he had been shot through the foot himself um, and was in fact quite badly wounded. Fortunately, the army had heard the, the crash and the gunfire and alerted us and we sent out the fire force and pulled Vic and his tech out uh, back to Fort Victoria where we got them into hospital. Uh, on debriefing Vic, uh, I realised that this was an exceptional case of bravery and recommended him for a Bronze Cross, uh, strongly supported by the Army, I might say. Uh, subsequently, as his citation uh, now reads, he was awarded the Silver Cross, so they upgraded him from a Bronze Cross to a Silver Cross. That was another example of, of somebody on a Kasavak that turned out to be a Kasavak himself. Uh, there was a, probably a more, uh, if you like, uh, less significant uh, occasion that I can think of. My good friend Eddie Wilkinson and I had, <clears throat> during our time in the Air Force, had written our commercial pilot's licences. So we were entitled to fly and instruct on, on light aircraft, which uh, we used frequently to instruct the, the police reserve air wing, who played an important role in the war and at the various forward airfields as relays and to do Casavacs occasionally. Um, and we were at uh, Gokwe airstrip during the war with a whole number of police reserve air wing guys. And uh, Eddie and I were controlling the circuits and landings training of the pro guys. Towards the end of the evening's flying, we noticed that there was a big storm brewing and coming in towards the airfield, so we asked all the pilots to land. All of them did, uh, and taxied in safely, with the exception of Ted Strever, who has a formidable wartime record of his own. And Ted landed, but he landed too deep. The wind had already veered, and he decided to go around again. 
Well, he didn't make it. He ploughed into the very tall Mapani trees off the end of the runway. And fortunately for him, the aircraft passed straight through the centre of two huge Mapanis, ripping both wings off, and then crashed onto the ground. Both him and his observer uh, had quite a bit of damage to their faces because they went into the instrument panel. As soon as I heard the crash, and I was con doing the radio controlling at the time, <clears throat> I ran off into the bush in the direction with my torch uh, to hopefully find what had happened and hopefully somebody, would, you know, both, both of them hadn't been killed. Well, coming in the opposite direction was Ted and, he, Ted and his observer running back towards the airfield. So Eddie Wilkinson then Casavac, the two of them, uh, out of there in very bad weather and flew them back to, uh, to Thornhill. So that was an example of a Casavac of some of our some of our own people and I, you know I guess there it was an almost daily occurrence that mm -hmm. uh, we were doing casualty evacuations mainly of uh, mainly of uh, army guys who'd been wounded and uh, another example uh, if you like was uh, the Casabac of Craig Bone who has now become quite a famous artist and who was doing his service with the RLI at the time mm -hmm. who on a cross-border had been wounded operation and um, his stick cut down some trees. We got to manage to get a helicopter in there and, and pull Craig out. Uh, I, I, th I think as a re result of that, he's always had a, a soft spot for, for the blue jobs. And uh, many, many years later, after I left the force, I managed to come by the painting that's hanging on the yes. wall in now uh, of the cameras doing a leading in a, a strike on a cross-border operation there and, and pulled him out. Uh, so he had a, a soft spot for the, for the blue jobs after that. Yeah. And many years later, he put this painting of his, because he's become quite famous now, I believe he's got paintings hanging in the Pentagon of, of you know, Vietnam ops and yes, so on. Yes, hmm. So he, he put this on. There was another Kazavak you were involved in, which was um, involved the South African police. Um, and I think you had a bit of a fallout with the SAP commander, but just tell us what actually happened there. Yeah, that was, I suppose, in hindsight, is, is one of the more amusing stories. It wasn't so amusing at the time. What had happened was the, the South African police had sent up uh, a number of, of guys in army uniform, but they were essentially policemen. And um, one of the their call signs, a stick, one of the guys who'd been out in patrol was bitten by a puff adder. <clears throat> so we got the call uh, to Kasavak, this chap, and I immediately asked the commandant who was on our jock in Mount Darwin to give me a grid reference, which he gave me, and I had a look at the map uh, having already called out our standby helicopter, which was Pete Simmons at the time, and his tech, to get ready and to get airborne immediately. Uh, it turned out that the grid reference he'd given me was in Mozambique, and I knew none of their troops were in Mozambique. So I asked him to relook at it, and he came back a few minutes later with a, another grid reference, which was in Zambia. <laughs> I then said to Pete Simmons, look, you must get airborne. I'll ask the commandant if the stick on the ground can light a fire and produce some smoke. So Pete got airborne. And I mean, he was a highly experienced and, and very uh, competent helicopter pilot. He got airborne with his tech. At that time of the year, there were a lot of fires in the, in the valley area. But after some considerable time, he managed to find the call sign and, and pull the guy out and we saved his life. He came back to Mount Darwin, got into hospital and was treated. 
And after the episode, uh, the Commandant came into the ops room where I was, and I said to him, you know, in a not unkindly way, that I think that they need to jack up their their map reading and their ability to give grid references on where their troops were in the event of uh, any future Casablanca. Whereupon his retort was, the trouble with your pilots is they can't navigate. <laughs> now that, that, I'm afraid, pressed the wrong button with me. <laughs> because I uh, really valued the competence and the efficiency and the ability of our pilots and uh, I wasn't prepared to stand for that, so I let him have it. Uh, to the extent that Dave Parker, who was the army <laughs> commander in that area, came through and said, I told you, you need to take it easy. You know, these guys have come here to help us. <laughs> You're now lambasing this commandant <laughs> with some fairly hefty language. <laughs> anyway, he went back to, uh, to South Africa and let the commissioner of police here know about the incident. And this week, wing commander who called him these terrible names and it resulted in a in a uh, a, a, a bit of a, an incident between our Air Force commander who subsequently wrote to me and said that you know everything had been smoothed over. <laughs> uh, Tol, uh, you're wearing a, an unusual watch with a red band which I think John's got a photograph um, of but just tell us about how you come to have that watch? Yeah, that goes back to the time when I was instructing on vampires. And um, the vampire was, was an aircraft uh, that would quite readily be put into a spin and from which you could recover. And it was one of the exercises that every pupil had to do and had to be competent at spinning in the vampire. Uh, and on this particular day, I was flying with uh, my pupil, Bill Buckle, and I put the aircraft into a spin, having, having briefed him before, and put the aircraft into, this, into a spin off, off the top of a loop. Because the aircraft will, will spin in any conditions if you ill-treat it enough. Uh, and it went into a, a spin, from which I then handed over control and said to him, recover. He attempted to recover correctly, but the aircraft then just seemed to want to recover and then it went into a steep stable spin pointing almost vertically downwards. So I then retook control. We'd gone into the spin at about uh, 14,000, 15,000 feet above sea level. But in the steep stable stage, the aircraft's losing about 1,500 feet per turn. And we were spinning fairly rapidly. So I was losing height quite quickly and looking at the, at the uh, Altimeter. I knew that we would, we were now closing in on the safe eject. Uh, you know the height at which you should eject. I took over control again, reconfirmed the recovery action, applied supplementary recovery action, which is to put full aileron into the direction of the spin. The aircraft uh, wouldn't come out of the spin, so I jettisoned the canopy and I said to Bill Buckle, "Eject, eject," which was the, which was the instruction to eject from the aircraft. But you're still in a dive. We're still in a vertical dive, yes. Spinning. Anyway, he looked at me with big eyes, you know, like, who me? Are you you're talking to me? <laughs> and I then shouted eject, and he ejected, went cleanly out of the aircraft. I then pulled my blind, the blind over my, my face, but it came over sideways, so the, the cord that pulls the pin, firing pin out of uh, the the firing mechanism came over the side of my face and I had to pull it back over the top of my head before the seat fired. Um, and I can remember you telling me the story of the, your, your buffalo attack. And people have often asked me, what was it like? Well, those early ejector seats, let me tell you, were brutal. And I, I couldn't find the cartridge this morning, but it's a huge cartridge. And of course, you're, you're, the, you're the projectile. There's no smooth acceleration like you now get on the modern ejector seats that use rockets. This was bang, and you were 40 feet out of the aircraft in an instant. Um, and so there, there were a number of people, myself included, that had minor injuries from, from that ejection. Anyway, when my parachute opened, I had a quick look around, uh, saw a farmhouse not too far away, and I saw a seat go 
falling away beneath me and I thought, oh my God, that's Bill Buckle and he's still strapped into his seat because that automatically uh, tipped you out of the seat and opened your parachute for you. I was only in the air for literally, I would think, 15, 20 seconds because my chute opened, I, th I think, in about three or 400 feet having come down from 15,000. And in the confused state, I landed like a sack of potatoes on the ground. Those chutes have very, you know, the parachute itself is relatively small. It's there to save your life, not to go, you know, not to go on a comfortable trip. So I landed uh, heavily on the ground and immediately started shouting for Bill Buckle because he ejected first. And in my confused state, of course, I thought he'd be on the ground first. Meanwhile, he was sailing down from a few thousand feet above me in his parachute while I was plunging down in the aircraft. So, of course, I came out much lower than, than he did. Uh, and, you know, about a minute later, he arrived not more than 30 yards away from me. And fortunately, he was okay. So I told him to stay there, ran off to the nearest farmhouse, which I could see, uh, which was about a mile away, I suppose, a couple of kilometers and ask the lady at the farm if I could, if I could phone back to Thornhill. <clears throat> and I spoke to the station commander, Doug White, and told him that we'd just crashed. Uh, fortunately, one of the air traffic controllers, who was idly sitting looking out of the window of, of uh, the control tower with his binoculars, saw one of, the heli one of the parachutes coming down. So he knew there was a, there'd been a crash, and he sent the fire engine out straight away. Uh, which came across me about halfway back to the farmhouse. Uh, it said to me, are you okay, sir? And I said, yes, I'm fine. My pupil is the other side of the hill here, so he drove off and left me there. <laughs> and I ran on to the farmhouse, uh, phoned Doug White, um, and he then passed on the message to, to my wife. Uh, I learned a very valuable lesson there, because later when I became station commander, it was one of the most unpleasant duties you could ever do as a station commander was to go and tell the wife, now widow, that her husband had crashed uh, and had, had been killed. And he always started uh, his telephone conversation with the words, I've just spoken to your husband. Oh, okay. And I inherited that from him because, you know, my wife told me that that had happened. He phoned her and said, I've just spoken to Tor and he's fine. But his aircraft has crashed. Well, and, uh, so what actually went wrong with the aircraft? On the yeah, the, the, the subsequent board of inquiry found that the rudder trim tab, tabs had been set out of their limit. So the, the rudder, the trim tab is uh, acting in opposition to your actual application of the rudder. So the rudder wasn't fully effective. And it was, the only, it was only the T-11 that had ejector seats. The FB-9 didn't. Uh, and you will recall the Full Hague uh, accident, mm -hmm. where pilots preferred to crash land to jumping out of the aeroplane, because with a tailplane behind you, jumping out of an FB-9 was uh, a very, very dangerous thing to do. So they preferred to force land. And, you know, at the time that, that I ejected, I think there'd only been three other ejections in the Air Force in its, in its history, All f and they were, uh, myself and my pupil, and Brian Horney and Rob Gaunt, uh, interestingly enough, they had ejected a few years prior to, to mine. Subsequent to that, there were a, there were a number of others, uh, guys who jumped out of uh, Hunters. Uh, Vic Whiteman, who was uh, with us for a long time, he ejected from a, a Lightning, and that's a different story. Tom, I, I can edit this out, but yeah. um, when I was a new boy at Plumtree, um, I was fagged to Dave Brown yes. on the subject of vampires. Yes. I wondered if you knew Dave. Yes, I did he indeed. He was the boy of country when yeah. I was there. Yeah, Dave, uh, Dave's accident uh, was happened whilst, I'm fairly certain, happened whilst I was station commander at Thornhill. And uh, he attempted to do a, a horseshoe force landing back at base. And he had just, unfortunately, didn't have sufficient height uh, there was a critical period after takeoff where you either ejected, crashed ahead of you, or if you'd reached a certain speed and height, which was about a thousand feet and maybe, maybe say 160, 180 knots, where you could then do a steep turn, horseshoe turn back and land back 
in the opposite direction to which you took off. Uh, Dave, uh, unfortunately, in trying to pull the aircraft around, stalled it, and the aircraft went into a spin, and he, he crashed and, and unfortunately died. I think it was in a T-11. Mm -hmm. the, I would need to check that. Uh, Gosh, you know, what a talented young man. Man. Yeah, he was a he was a great guy. He was his president of uh, Martin Baker at the time, and again many years later, because there were relatively few ejections, thank goodness, from uh, from aircraft. Um, but I can talk to you about that if you like. Yeah. This, this watch, incidentally, yeah. is a is a Bramont, which my son found that they make them in conjunction with Martin Baker, so it's got the Martin Baker sign on it. And with this red band around it, it means that your life's been saved by, by an ejector seat. Sure. Oh, uh, this, this watch. Okay. Get the red band. Where's the red band? Oh, there, there, there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you can buy Vermont watches, but the red band signifies that you're an ejector. That's a pretty silly. Just um, <clears throat> talk us through the aircraft that you flew and got to know well and um, maybe just a little bit of technical information on what you liked about them, what you didn't like, what their limitations were, um, just a bit about the machines that you, were, that you operated. Um, at the time that I started my training, early in 1958, uh, our basic flying was done on the Provost which had a, a nine-cylinder radial Leonides engine, developed about 550 horsepower, so it was quite a powerful machine. Uh, tail dragger. Uh, so it was a re relatively complex aircraft to do your basic flying on, and it sorted out the chaff from the wheat. If you could, uh, if you could handle the, the provost, uh, particularly on landing, and you could get through that training, then uh, the chances of you being scrubbed on advanced flying school were greatly reduced. So most of our, of our pupils who didn't make the grade, and we generally inducted between 15 and 20, and would pass between sort of five and eight of those guys would get through the training. Most of them would, would leave us during basic flying uh, school. So the, the Provost was the first aircraft. After that, you went on to the Vampire Advanced Flying School, first the T-11, and once you'd uh, satisfied your instructor that you could handle the, the T-11, the two-seater, uh, you went on to the FB-9, which was a delightful aircraft, uh, light to handle, still all manual controls, of course. It was a very good uh, aircraft for aerobatics and for ground attack. And I certainly enjoyed flying the FB-9. We used it very successfully uh, throughout our war and also during uh, our trips to, to Aden, to Cormaxa, uh, on ground attack. It was, uh, it was very successful in that particular road. It carried quite a formidable weapon load for, for such a small aircraft. Uh, and then you got your, your wings, and depending on where you got posted to after that, it could be any aircraft type. Uh, I initially went back uh, onto Provost 
and was involved with the Niceland emergency. And then went, uh, went back onto, onto vampires and onto instruction. Uh, after that, the next aircraft that I flew was, was the Hunter, which was an absolute classic uh, aircraft. I mean, in its day, uh, it, was, it was an absolute delight to fly. It was a world beater. And in the ground attack role, it was, it was particularly successful. Our version of the, of the Hunter, and there were several versions of them, was the FGA-9 fighter ground attack, uh, Mark 9. Uh, it had the Avon 207 engine, uh, which developed uh, nearly 11,000 pounds of thrust. So it had a very good um, climb performance, uh, lots of power. And the first solo on the, on the FGA, because we had no two-seaters, so Keith Corrins was our... Um, instructor on the simulator and from the simulator you got into the hunter and fluid so that first trip was always fairly exciting it was power uh, controls and never having flown an aircraft with power controls you would always see the guy on his first solo getting airborne and waggling his wings because he was overcorrecting the whole time but a, a fantastic aircraft and once you you got into the swing of things uh, on on the hunter it was an absolute delight to fly. I didn't fly very many operational sorties. Guys like Rich Brand and Vic Whiten, for instance, both of whom became squadron commanders uh, of, the, of number one squadron, flew far more sorties, operational sorties, than I ever did. And their records speak for, the, speak for themselves. Tell us, uh, what weaponry was available to you on the Hunter? Um, the, the most formidable was the four uh, cannons, 30 millimeter cannon, mm. so it's a it's a big uh, it's a big round, and each cannon was capable of of uh, firing 1,300 rounds per minute. So you were pouring out 20 rounds a second, and generally speaking, uh, if you were doing ground attack, uh, you would pass through that firing uh, window, the firing range, very very quickly, and it was normally just a one or two second burst because that would uh, that would put over a hundred rounds on the ground. It, you know, it would flatten a building, for instance, or any any vehicles. So that was uh, very effective. Uh, it actually, it, the the recoil from those four cannons was such that you could actually feel it as though you put the air brakes out on the on the Hunter. Uh, and then it had, we had uh, the normal three-inch rockets, which could have uh, high explosive or squash head. Uh, configuration on them and you could carry bombs up to a thousand pounds uh, on each wing and uh, you could have napalm so there was great variety and because the aircraft uh, had exceptionally strong wings we normally flew with 230 gallon tanks under each wing which gave you very good uh, right. range and endurance. I mean, we could reach uh, virtually every target within, uh, you know, within our borders out of Thornhill, and get to the to the target within within 20 or 30 minutes, depending on which border it was, and then have a considerable amount of loiter time still there with your weapon load before having to come back. Tom, just tell us about the aiming mechanism when you were using your your guns on the on the hunter um talk us through the lining up how you took aim at the target uh Hannes, the the gun sight was uh, by today's standards of course pretty pretty uh primitive uh, mm -hmm. and it was a gyro stabilized sight uh, which you could set up for either guns or rockets and, and then you would depress the, the gun sight to allow for the, the, gr the gravity drop and the range at which you were going to be firing. But it did require very careful handling by the, by the pilot. It made, you had to make sure that you were at the, at the correct uh, angle of, of uh, okay. attack, that you were at the correct speed and at the correct height and range when you fired. So all of those things had to be taken into consideration. When you fire a rifle, just to put it uh, 
into perspective. You fire a rifle. Um, the only elements that you have to think of are the, the wind and the range um, that, you know, that you're firing at. In the, in the aircraft, you've got all sorts of other forces that impact the thing. You're changing your range the whole time. You're not static. Uh, the wind may vary. Uh, depending on the height, the gravity drop varies. The speed of the aircraft will determine how long it will, what the total velocity of the bullet is as it leaves the aircraft, and so on. So it was a, it was a complex exercise that needed constant, uh, constant training. Tell us the the Bud Dustman story. Who was involved in that? Well, that there was, was a, a there was a bit with someone. someone. Yes, yes uh, it it was. I think there was a, a report that it. Had happened in a newspaper, and Rich Brand was uh, was reported to be a dead-eyed dick on the hunter, which he certainly was, uh, and that he could hit a, a a dustbin in the middle of the bush, and there was you know there was a lot of uh, fairly sarky comments about <laughs> about that. So what the the guy at the range did, a chap called Mackenzie Mac Mackenzie, a super guy. Uh, he put a, took a dustbin, a tin dustbin, and went and put it out on the range. And Rich Brand came in and with one single attack, uh, put several holes in the, in the dustbin. <laughs> so that was the background to the story. They then took pictures of the dustbin full of holes. Incredible <laughs> story. Um, tall canvas, you were on canvas for a while? Yeah, I was uh, on canvas for, for just on two years. Um, and that uh, was my my last uh, flying active flying uh, command. Uh, the Canberra was, uh, you know, if the if the hunter was a was a real uh, hard nosed fighter, the Canberra was a was a lady in in comparison. It was still manual, uh, and so it was heavier on the on the controls. No such luxuries as as autopilot. And the aircraft was designed uh, for high-level bombing, generally in, in fairly smooth conditions. Uh, but, uh, you know, also a, a lovely aircraft to, to fly. Considerably more range, of course, than, than, the, uh, than the Hunter. And that opens up the door to uh, far more uh, long-range exercises, such as reconnaissance and photo reconnaissance, mm -hmm. mapping, uh, and, and for that matter, delivering of, of weapons. But inevitably, as our war progressed, uh, we were modifying the aircraft to carry weapons that it wasn't designed to carry. Rockets and uh, fragmentation bombs, bomb boxes. Peter Pedaboya was heavily involved in a lot of these weapons developments and in the targeting systems that we used together with the Army. Time delayed, uh, time delayed, lights and smoke and so on uh, that these, the scouts and the SAS put out for us. So these weapon systems and delivery systems developed as the war went on uh, and uh, in that regard the, the Canberra really fulfilled a lot of roles but it, it did put the aircraft under huge stress, a uh, stress factor that was much higher than was originally designed uh, and as I mentioned in my, my earlier uh, session with you, we tragically lost uh, uh, one of the, the uh, aircraft. The, the techs in their usual ways, uh, the engineers applied their minds to it and were able to strengthen the frame 21, which is the one that uh, shears, which attaches the wing to the, the fuselage. and. Uh, they were able to modify our aircraft, so that did make them considerably safer than they had been before. So the, the modern day aviator has a range of navigation systems. In your time, it was pretty rudimentary. Um, and I know it always fascinated me and everybody else, I think, just how you guys managed to find your way to your targets. Um, just. Talk a bit about the navigational aids that you had and how you managed to do it. When I joined the Air Force, um, 
and we were lectured in ground training school on navigation. We had a navigator who happened to be the station edge at Thornhill, a guy called McLaughlin, Laughing Mac, not Porky Mac, Laughing Mac, he was called, because he was always laughing, and he was a World War II navigator. And I clearly recall to this day him walking into our lecture room on the very first day that, uh, that we were being taught navigation. And uh, he said to us, gentlemen, I'm here to, to teach you about navigation. What you need to remember is that if you fly an aircraft for roughly the right length of time, in roughly the right direction, you will get roughly to where you want to go to. And he turned around and walked out. <laughs> it, was supposed to be, it was supposed to be an hour-long lecture. But boy, did that ever, did that ever stick yes. with us. Because it is so true, it's very easy uh, to find yourself lost, to suddenly say, I'm lost, I don't know where I am. And you have to remind yourself that if I've flown the aircraft roughly in the right direction for roughly the right length of time, I'll, I'll be pretty close to where I want to go to. So a considerable amount of it was dead reckoning, but it wasn't just simple dead reckoning. Dead reckoning. Obviously, we knew what the met conditions were, what the weather, the winds were doing. We knew uh, pretty accurately what our ground speed would be. And we had simple methods of marking out our maps, developing a system of marking your maps so that you knew at, at a particular speed exactly how many nautical miles you would be covering per minute. And so we could get it down to the, literally down to the second. And some of the areas lent themselves to relatively easy navigation by, by map reading. Other areas, particularly in the southeast around the uh, Mabaluta, Malapati, uh, down to um, the Russian front, uh, the, yeah, to Rutenga, and, uh, and that sort of area was very, very flat and featureless. And, and there you had to rely on rivers and roads and, and railway lines uh, and any small feature that you could to estimate, you know, to try and calculate exactly where you are. There were non-directional uh, uh, non beacon, beacons as well, uh, but those uh, f at low level, which we operated a lot of the time, even in the Canberra, were of very little use to you. So it was, it was a question of dead, re dead reckoning and training you know, training the whole time to the extent that I think, and that's why I got so upset about the guy saying, you, you guys don't know how to navigate, because they certainly did. And night flying um, in the cameras and stuff, reconnaissance, well, that was just time and distance. Yeah, they, uh, we, didn't, we didn't, of course, in the camera do a lot of uh, reconnaissance at night. We did do um, a lot of photo, uh, photographic reconnaissance at very long range um, with uh, with cameras. Uh, in those days, very sophisticated cameras to the extent that uh, I know the largest one of that had a 48 inch lens yeah. from which you could you could actually see yeah. even from from above 30,000 feet you could pick out individual people. So photographs of a terrorist camp, for instance, would identify with a great deal of accuracy, the number of people that were actually in the camp from very high altitude. Tol, um, you mentioned Police Reserve Air Wing earlier. Um, I just want to take you back to that. Uh, just talk a bit more about their involvement and the roles of the pro pilots, because I know they, they played a, a huge role um, in, in the war, um, and I know you had quite a bit to do with them. Uh, yes, we would we were generally allocated at least one police reserve uh, air wing aircraft, and they varied. Uh, there were all sorts of, of light aircraft from four seaters to six seaters. Generally speaking, uh, they were people who owned their own aircraft or um, who leased aircraft. And they would vary. There were Cherokees and Cessnas and Bonanzas, you know, you name it. Uh, and they came with different degrees of skill as well. Some of the pilots were experienced, knew their own aircraft very well and uh, had night ratings, uh, which was essential if you were going to operate in the operational areas, particularly doing Kasseberg. A lot of the time they, they uh, did uh, airborne relay 
Uh, they did uh, light transport of, uh, of commanders, particularly army commanders who wanted to get in a hurry to, to some of their forward troops. Uh, so, Kazavaks. Kazavaks. Uh, you know, that, that was the type of thing that they did. I know that, that both PB and um, Koki Bienica were instrumental in instructing on, on airborne reconnaissance from their aircraft, uh, particularly if it was a high-wing aircraft. It was very difficult to do visual reconnaissance from an aircraft if it was a low-wing low aircraft like a Cherokee. And, and some of the, the, uh, the pilots, like Hammy Dax, uh, became very proficient at it. Uh, a number of the other, other guys that we flew with, Peter Scales and Colin Bickle, uh, they were very competent on their own aircraft. You know, some of them were turned into sort of mini gunships, where they? they actually managed to mount some weaponry and so on. Yeah, um, there were some, some side-mounted uh, guns, I believe. Uh, I think, I think with, and I say this with great respect, uh, but I think uh, those were fairly desperate uh, measures because it's very difficult to, to complete that kind of uh, training with people and to get accurate ground fire down uh, from a, uh, an aircraft like that. You know, normally ground attack is done with guns that face forward. And to the best of my recollection, the Pro used side-mounted guns which was fine if you were in a helicopter, which could fly sideways, but fixed wing aircraft don't fly so well sideways. So I, I think they, they had limited success with that. And mm. I've no doubt uh, some of the ex pro pilots <laughs> will, will take me to task about that, but I, th <laughs> I think it had limited success. Tol, um, a, a low ebb in your Air Force career, you, you're court-martial. Um, talk us through what, what happened and how you got yourself into trouble. Um, yes, I suppose with some reluctance, Hannes, but you may as well hear the, the uh, bad with the good. Uh, it was at an early stage of my, my flying career and one of the guys on the squadron who became a good friend was Eric Carey, a highly successful sportsman. He was on the course just ahead of mine um, with Gordon Wright and Keith Corrins. Hofmeyer and so on. He was very interested in all sorts of sport and he'd done the, um, the doozy marathon a couple of times and got me interested in training with him on, uh, on canoeing. So we duly had a canoe built, a two-seater, and started going out for weekends, sometimes for the whole weekend, camping out at night and canoeing down rivers like the Amniati. And on this particular day, we'd both been authorized to do general flying. And we had a chat before the, the flight, and uh, it was suggested that we go and have a look at the Amniati to see how much water there was in the river so that we could go and canoe down it for the weekend. But of course, that was not what we were authorized to do. So off we went in radio silence, joined up at a predetermined place and then flew in battle formation down the river to have a look at it. Turned round and on the way back, flying down the river, uh, we had briefed that Eric would lead the first half of the trip and I would lead coming back. So I was flying to overtake him, to, to overtake the lead, with radio silence, no calls being given. And Eric started what I th think afterwards was a slow roll. We were flying reasonably though. What are you craft here? We were in FB9s, vampires. Oh, okay. And, uh, and I then realised that he was doing a slow roll towards the right-hand side, which was the side that I was overtaking him on. So I pulled away hard to the right and then reversed the direction to see where, he, where he'd got to because I was at overtake speed. And his aircraft had, had ploughed into the ground. <clears throat> there was a huge explosion on the ground. And I realised immediately there was absolutely no chance that he could have survived it. Uh, because he was, you know, we were flying at something like 350 knots, 600 kilometres an hour. 
So I immediately pulled up and reported the accident to uh, a traffic controller at Thornhill. And they subsequently sent out a team which went to the crash site. Uh, the subsequent board of inquiry uh, recommended that because we had carried unauthorized low flying that I should be court-martialed. It was the first court-martial of an officer in the Royal Rhodesian Air Force. Uh, and uh, I was found guilty and was docked uh, seniority, which I could ill afford at that stage. I, I was married and had you know, fairly hefty financial commitments. So when all the rest of my course got promoted, I was held back. And uh, I, I guess uh, it was a, a hard lesson to learn. One of the lessons that I certainly learned from that was that, uh, you know, you must, you must correct those faults. And I was determined to, to press on and, and manage to do so in the years that followed. Tell, um, talking about uh, not following the rules too closely. There was Ian Harvey. Um, he was used to go and collect beer on occasions. <laughs> yes, it was. I think it was on my first uh, trip as a flight lieutenant uh, on an op operational, early in Operation Hurricane, and based at Sipalilo. Uh, Ian I was asked by, by the army rep uh, that uh, they wanted to do a relay change uh, on top of one of the hills, which was perfectly legitimate. Uh, and he said, oh, by the way, we've run out of beers in the mess and you know, could the pilot just drop in at the, at the uh, polo club on the way back and pick up a crate of beers for us? And I thought, well, not too much harm done there. So off uh, went halves in the helicopter, uh, replaced the relay, and then on the way back, to the consternation of the guys who were playing polo, landed in the middle of the polo field. <laughs> <laughs> and his tech ran into the, into the club and bought a crate of beer. On the, back, on the way back, flying at low level, uh, Ian flew into some telephone lines, which shattered the windshield Fortunately, it didn't do any more damage to either him or to the aircraft. But of course, uh, landing back, we had to report the. In I had to report the incident that he'd flown into some telephone lines. And uh, I then jumped into a, a jeep to to go and speak to the farmer whose telephone line had been pulled down because they were on a security system, there, uh, using their telephones. And. Uh, I noticed the name Deal on the farmhouse gate, which caused a bit of a flutter. I drove in to, knocked on the front door and a fairly elderly farmer came out uh, and I said, look, I've come to let you know that I, we are responsible for taking your telephone lines out. We've been in touch with the engineers. They will be out shortly to, to do the repair. Uh, and I'm very sorry about uh, having done this. Uh, and he said, okay, well, well, fine. He didn't invite me in, but I, I said to him, Mr. Deal, are you, do you happen to be related in any way to Air Commodore Deal? <laughs> and he said to me, yes, he's my little brother. <laughs> Johnny Deal was, uh, was the uh, chief of staff at the time in the Air Force, so that caused more than a little bit of consternation. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to his credit, I must say, it wasn't until some time later when I was in Air Force headquarters that uh, the, the uh, Chief of Staff, uh, in, in talking to me one evening, said, by the way, I must tell you that I know that Ian Harvey had been picking up beers when he flew through those <laughs> telephone lines. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. We tend to forget how important a role a, a woman played in this whole period of time. Um, just talk a bit about uh, the ladies that uh, got so involved and also showed enormous courage and fortitude. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, honest, that is one of the things that probably happened too late uh, when I think of, of uh, modern warfare. 
to lighten our walk, but they did become very involved uh, initially in, uh, in more backroom type of jobs. But we can all remember that before that, Sally Donaldson had her program where she uh, passed on messages to the troops and that everybody, we all avidly lis listened yes. to that and it contributed substantially to the morale. Mm. But yeah. it, went, it went a lot further than that, you know. I, I can remember at Fort Victoria, um, for instance, on Opry Pulse, where there was a, ca a canteen that was set up by the wives and the local ladies um, that supported the, the troops on their way out into the bush mm -hmm. and on deployment, mm -hmm. where they could get a hot meal and a cup of coffee and a drink on their way out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also be in the company of some good-looking ladies from time to time, yeah. all of which contributed uh, to the morale. I think nowadays when we think of morale, or people talk of morale, it's out of context. You know, they're talking about the spirit of a rugby team when it runs onto the field, that they've got the morale right. Uh, in, in wartime, morale refers to the general spirit uh, and attitude of the nation and of the whole army. Yeah. That's what the maintenance of morale means. Yeah. That fighting spirit keeps uh, is st and stays there. And those are in our periods that we had. The ladies helping us uh, and bolstering the morale. That was, uh, to me, uh, what was so very important and kept us, I think, ahead with our small force of the growing numbers of terrorists that we had to confront. Uh, you know, there and. I've mentioned Casavax, that was, that was one of the uh, prime, uh, prime advantages that we had over the enemy. So, yeah, uh, I, th I think when I look back, um, those women who were left virtually alone on the farms, um, the men were away, they, uh, they were fighting a lonely battle out there. Um, trying to keep a farm going, trying to keep everything together. In a way, it was probably easier for the men because they were out there with their, with their mates and um, there's a, a wife left behind in a lonely place. Um, very, very tough. No, it was. And, you know, uh, particularly one is reminded of the number of farm murders that uh, that we had in just those sort of circumstances. You know, uh, I can remember again uh, in that regard that Butswart, who was the 2IC at, uh, on, on uh, Op Hurricane for some time, and uh, Butt regularly used to invite me to go out with him to dinner at night to one of the farmers in the local area near Mount Darwin or near St. Henry. And I must tell you that those trips I didn't enjoy one little bit. I'm quite happy sitting, sitting in a cockpit where I'm familiar with my surroundings and I know what I'm doing. But going out on those landmine roads that night in a Land Rover was not my idea of fun. But we did it because we knew that it was essential that those people who had the courage to stay on those farms were aware that the military commanders were also prepared to travel on those roads at night. We were mm -hmm. also prepared to go out there and visit them. So, you know, those, those small things all contributed to exactly what, uh, what you're talking about. And, and I mean, the, the women that stayed on the farms and their the husbands would be either on call up or with the police reserve air wing or with the police reserve. Uh, it's incredible, uh, mm -hmm. the bravery that they showed. Churchill, you know, he spoke about the non-discriminating bullet um, and he made quite an interesting point there. Just explain that and, and in, in the modern con context, just, you know, what's just happened in, in Afghanistan. Yeah, I suppose, you know, if one reads history, uh, which I try to do fairly extensively, you become aware that over centuries, uh, successful countries and successful leaders very often were either involved in the military or were military leaders. And there, there are so many examples, I won't even bother to, to mention them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
nowadays it seems to me that more and more if you're successful in business and you know how to manage a business that tends to qualify you to get into politics and then eventually become a leader even a world leader and I think I think we're missing something here I think there's a fault there somewhere because in business you can make mistakes you can recover from them you can learn from them and you can grow your business can become more successful as Churchill said in his statement but the indiscriminating bullet settles everything uh, and that just simply means that when you're dealing with lives with your comrades lives people that you fight with side by side when you're dealing with that kind of situation there is an awareness of the need mm. to be absolutely certain about what you're doing how you're going to do it because the cost in the end is not that you will lose a couple of dollars the cost is that you will lose lives the lives of your friends very often mm -hmm. and so you'd better take your role particularly if it's a leadership role very very seriously and this is where a guy like uh, president biden doesn't have that background um, he doesn't seem to be able to take this whole afghanistan debacle too seriously yeah, you know, it uh, would, would be difficult for me to to comment uh, seriously about that because I don't know uh, enough about Biden's background. Uh, I know that he's a fairly elderly gentleman. Uh, he speaks uh, very, he's very erudite when he when he talks. Uh, but I I cannot help but feel that uh, that the hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan, from a military point of view, strategic point of view, has got to be a failure in the long term, has got to have been a disaster in the long term. And I don't believe that the long term consequences have been fully explored uh, when the decision was made, the strategic decision was made to pull out of there. The first uh, principle of war is of course the selection and maintenance of the aim and maintenance of the aim it's the first principle of war not only of von Clausewitz but uh, several other uh, historical uh, characters who were fantastic leaders over the centuries and the second you said was the maintenance, maintenance of morale of yeah and morale worldwide uh, has taken a hang of a dive with this uh, I, I think it has created a lot of despair and despondency, John. Mm. I don't think there's any doubt. Yeah, particularly amongst those soldiers who fought there and lost friends there and, you know, kind of why, what purpose? Yes, it, it reaches, uh, you know, it reaches every member of the uh, population in the end because so many people have dedicated their, their lives to to the military and to the protection of your country and mm. its citizens. You know, the first, the first requirement of any government, in my humble opinion, is the protection of the state and its citizens. Yeah. That is its first priority. Mm. And I sometimes wonder, when I see how uh, governments respond now and how they act, whether that is still in the forefront of their mind. When I see, for instance, the riots that we've had in South Africa, is that protecting the state and its citizens? And the people pouring through the southern borders of the United States. I mean, they, they're not able to protect their own borders. The people that are pouring into the United Kingdom out of, out of France. It's happening all over Europe. All of, the, uh, all of the African countries that despised uh, colonization and the influx of, of people into Africa are now all rushing back into Europe. To all the colonial powers. I struggle to I understand the logic of I that. Know. Yeah, we've got off the subject, I suppose, a little bit of, uh, <laughs> of Rhodesia and, it, and its, uh, its war. But, you know, um, I think a, a tragic consequence of, of what is happening is that, uh, you know, I have four sons and, and three of them have been employed uh, overseas highly successfully in various parts of the world and <coughs> one, my one son who's left in South Africa is really battling as a white male to find a decent responsible job so all of that knowledge uh, and experience uh, and skill 
lost, has, has been lost to this country so that we can have cadre de deployment. And, uh, and, and it saddens me not only from a family point of view because it's disrupted the, the family mm -hmm. like it has done with thousands of other families in South Africa. Mm -hmm. We're getting philosophical here now. But the country's the loser. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Thank you.